So okay. welcome everyone. Uh, thank you all for joining the Rise Easy Computer Engineering Distinguished Speaker webinar. Uh, before our speaker today, I'm going to briefly go through some logistics. So first, if you have any questions during the talk, you can either type your question in the Q&A chat or raise your hand. And at the end of the talk, we will select those questions to be answered by our speaker. Uh, meanwhile, if you think it makes more sense to, uh, for your question to be addressed during the talk, you can uh, do so as well. I will uh, keep track of the Q&A chat, uh, chat. And second, uh, this talk will be recorded and uploaded to our department's uh, YouTube channel for future access. So next, uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce today's uh, distinguished speaker, Dr. Helen Lee, who is currently a Claire Bush Luce uh, professor and an associate chair for operations uh, in the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering at Duke University. She received her PhD from Duke University uh, where she co-directs uh, the Center for Computational Evolutionary Intelligence and the NSF uh, IUCRC Center for Alternative, Sustainable and Intelligent Computing. Her research interests include machine learning acceleration and security, um, neuromorphic circuits and systems for brain-inspired computing, uh, conventional and emerging memory design and architecture, and also software hardware co-design. She has received numerous awards and recognitions for her research, including the NSM Career Award and the DAPA Young Faculty Award, and eight best paper awards and another nine best paper nominations. She's an IEEE fellow and an uh, ACM distinguished member. Uh, thank, thanks very much, Helen, for accepting our invitation. I now turn over to, your, to you. Sure. Thank you so much. Uh, you know, uh, thanks a lot for the warm introduction, Indian, and also uh, inviting me over here. Uh, in fact, it's my great pleasure to uh, virtually visit Arise. Uh, as I said uh, uh, to uh, Indian uh, previously, I visited Arise University a few years back. It has a very nice campus and very good students, uh, which impressed me uh, significantly. So uh, previously, when I visited the Rice, and I guess, and we talk about majorly focus on the hardware designs. So today's talk, I will change a little bit and talking more about the software side, and also uh, you know the relations to the hardware designs. So my talk today will be efficient deep learning at a scale. Um, you know, nowadays, and when people talking about the deep learning. Uh, it's becomes a quite popular word, so I guess I don't have to advertise and furthermore. Uh, but one important thing that right now we are doing is uh, scaling up the deep learning models. So this page essentially what I wanted to uh, demonstrate why scaling up the models are important. So on the left hand side, this is the very famous in, uh, kind of a figures discussing about the relation of the model's accuracy versus the operation, the computation requirement measured by giga ops. And this used in the famous image net as the benchmark. So in uh, on those figures in each dot or the circular represent a model and uh, the area represent its size. Okay, so except this in VGG series, and which were kind of designed at the early stage. So in recent years, the DNA models exploration, as you can see, for better accuracy, usually the model size is large and requires an, uh, uh, more operations, especially when we reserve the uh, 
models on the, the same series, like the ResNet series or uh, Inception series, the trend becomes more obvious. Okay. Similarly, we observe uh, uh, language models. So here, y-axis represent the test perplexity. That's uh, the lower, the better. So if we use a transformer uh, models and explore the trend, in fact, uh, similarly, the bigger models with more operations uh, can obtain a better uh, accuracy of the results. So generally speaking, I think the trend is uh, larger models and bring in the better prediction uh, accuracies. Okay. However, um, better model, bigger models, and it's not that easy in our implementation. Basically, uh, there are substantial obstacles to build the larger models. We kind of briefly they separated into the training side and also the inference side. Training large models will be very, very slow because you can imagine the training is taking this in iterations of forward path, uh, loss calculation, back propagation, uh, you know, gradient uh, descent calculation, and so on and so forth. And usually we say, okay, it could go to a couple of hundreds of thousands of uh, epochs, right? And there's every epoch is going to go through the entire training set of the data. So larger models indicating that uh, the training time will be really, really long. And it might face the situation that uh, it cannot converge. Um, there have been substantial research uh, and uh, activities along those lines, like uh, how to improve the trainings. And, but as you know, then, uh, again, uh, the progress is uh, slow. And uh, in fact, uh, we're taking a lot of efforts on, on this. On the other side is the inference, OK? Um, basically, we applied our models into cloud at the beginning. But now, right now, the trend is to deploy this into some edge devices our phones, or even we're talking about autonomous cars. For all this, um, uh, you know, uh, edge, the equipment that are edge, we basically face the limit of computation and the memory constraints. Even when we're talking about autonomous cars, obviously it has a more battery life than, than a cell phone, but uh, obviously it's also have a higher requirement in terms of the accuracy, uh, you know, safety requirement, uh, security requirement and therefore the corresponding uh, models or the requirement at the algorithm levels, in fact, is also higher. So in recent years, and uh, our groups have spent quite efforts in trying to improve the efficiency of the DNNs on both inference and the trainings. Okay, so in today's talk, I kind of jump into the content directly. I would like to uh, uh, briefly present our recent research outcomes on uh, both uh, directions. So talking about inference at the edge, I will first introduce our work called the Deep Hollier. The major goal of it, this work is to uh, seek for differentiable and scale invariant sparsity inducing regularizer so that it can help uh, or friendly to the training processes. The work was uh, published on SLR this year. And then uh, Penny is talking about utilizing pruned kernel sharings that improved inference and speed. Um, and during the, this is more like a, a low rank approximation approach and uh, the work was published on uh, ICML. Uh, on training side, we majorly focus on the training in the cloud, I guess, and common practices and we have to have a lot of uh, servers or a lot of uh, uh, accelerators and to enable faster training. ACPAR is kind of a software and hardware combined approach it is discussing how do we partition the tensor across different layers and so that the training can become more efficient and faster. Um, so considering uh, it's a relation to the hardware and the work was submitted to HPC. Um, in fact, we also, another uh, uh, trend is in talking about the NAS neural architecture search. And the auto grow, in fact, is in particular uh, discuss the layer growing uh, automatically and what kind of a strategy to be applied. 
So considering the time constraint today, so I might not have time to discuss about the detail of this work, but if you're interested, you may reference KDD 2020 for our paper. So uh, let me jump into the first and deep how year. Um, this one is talking about the sparsity uh, induced regularizer for the DNNs. Okay, you may heard about that during the DNN trainings, we apply certain regularizers. And uh, L1 and L0 are pretty popular sparsity induced regularizers. The figure on the right hand side actually present a contour and the gradient direction of the two regularizers. Okay, so compare those regularizers. The L1 regularizer is differentiable and convex, so it is easy to uh, optimize. However, the value of the L1 regularizer um, is proportional to the scale of the parameters. So we say this is not, uh, so I mean, it's kind of a scaled down all the elements with the same speed. Okay, but it, you know, in the DNA models, and especially for some weights with large um, absolute values, it might be uh, important um, for the operations. So conceptually, uh, we do not want it to penalize those large elements significantly. Okay, for L0 regularizer uh, illustrated over here, um, it's directly reflect the sparsity by definition and it's a skill invariant. However, the problem of L0 regularizer is um, it couldn't provide useful gradient. Its gradient um, either kind of an uh, infinite if uh, it is a seed on the axis or will be zero everywhere else. So uh, it cannot work directly or incorporate directly with the gradient descent optimizers. Uh, in fact, we need additional tricks, uh, for example, stochastic approximation, ADML, so also first to apply it on the DNN pruning. Okay, so in other words, L0 is difficult. Uh, uh, I mean, and make the optimization more complicated. So uh, our work is tend to find a sparsity inducing regularizer, and that has to be both differentiable and uh, skill invariant. So when we're looking for such kind of uh, uh, regularizers and how you regularizer, in fact, I illustrate on the right hand figures, uh, kind of draw our attention. Um, mathematically, it is the ratio of the L1 norm and the L2 norm. So we kind of tend to apply the how you regularizer, uh, you know, in DNN and trainings. Basically, for element-wise the yin and prunings, we propose to apply the squared version of the Hoyer regularizer, and we name it as an Hoyer square regularizer. So it can be easily seen that the, uh, this regularizer is differentiable, uh, skill invariant, and also it has the same range and uh, similar minimal structure as an L0. So for uh, this regularizer, its minimum is one when only one uh, element in the weight is non zero, and the minimal, maximum um, is the total number of the elements. It happens when all the elements uh, have the same non zero value. Okay. For um, higher, uh, kind of a higher square regularizers, and we are also considering about the structure pruning. Essentially, we tend to guide the weight. So, for example, for the CNNs or convolutional layers, we tend to prune the entire channels or prune the entire filters instead of the uh, randomly pruning certain uh, uh, weight uh, during the convolution uh, operations. So in order to achieve such kind of structure pruning, uh, we can group uh, uh, higher uh, square regularizers all together. So basically the equation over here kind of uh, indicating like we apply the idea of um, group plus cells. Um, so here, the kind of uh, define the groups of the weights. Uh, as I said, it could be 
uh, channel, it could be a, a filter, it could be even a layer of your neural network. And then we apply this in uh, a higher square regularizer on top of this. So the impact of this is all the ways within the same group will be induced to become zero simultaneously. Okay. So um, uh, getting some, uh, uh, so one observing the gradient of the uh, higher square regularizer over here uh, with respect to each element in the weight matrices. So we kind of can derive and search kind of a, a expression over here. So very important, I wanted to draw your attention, in fact, is in this subtraction term, okay? This induce what we call the auto-training uh, effect, okay? So um, I also have the bottom figure. This is coming from the experiments and to show how does an auto-training apply to the situation, okay? Um, on this figure, x axis, in fact, is the training epoch, and the y axis is, um, is corresponding to the absolute value of the weight elements. And each colorful curves represent uh, one of the random example the weight. Okay, so the dash line uh, represent the threshold we defined over here, and it's coming, in fact, from this and subtraction term. Okay, so. Uh, in fact, this gradient indicating that if the uh, absolute value of the uh, weight is smaller than this in threshold, then the uh, group higher uh, regularizers will tend to make it getting smaller and smaller, kind of a scaling down. And if this is bigger than the threshold, then our regularizer will not uh, apply the effect on this weight. So as you can see that uh, for all the sum weights, majority weights, and that's smaller than the threshold, they actually going to be zeroed. But the larger weights will be protected. Another interesting observation, in fact, is in the threshold of the auto trainings, and in fact, uh, gradually uh, increases because the more and more weights are coming close to zero. Okay, so we actually can determine one, two, uh, stop the trend, and that's control the sparsity of uh, our design. So in the next two pages, I'm going to show part of our experimental results. Uh, and this page actually are the results for element-wise and pruning results, um, the Net5 and also AlexNet. Um, so compared to the original, uh, kind of an, uh, state of art designs, even um, our uh, methodologies can achieve an quite significant improvement in terms of the uh, compression rate. Um, like majority of the uh, compression methodologies and free connect layers is the target, and the other method kind of uh, performed pretty well on the fully connect layers. So the reason for compression, uh, like focus more on the free connect layer, in fact, is and it's contribute majority of the uh, weight elements and therefore the storage requirement. Okay. Um, we, in fact, also uh, apply that to uh, convolutional dominant neural networks. For example, here is the results for ResNet 50 um, ImageNet. ResNet 56 on Cypher and ResNet uh, uh, 110 on the Cypher. Okay, um, so the blue dots on each of the different figures represent the performance of state of art uh, uh, previous works. And the X axis represent the accuracy and the Y axis represent the computation cost of flop numbers. So here, in fact, uh, we construct a structure specialties. So the uh, compressions and kind of and have a direct relation with the flops numbers in execution. So if we're looking at and compare all these results, and clearly uh, our uh, results achieve the best trade-off curves between accuracy and number of the flops. Um, and we, uh, after perform the uh, Pareto frontier composed by all previous methodologies, okay? So this is kind of a demonstrate effect of our methodology. So um, 
this actually conclude the introduction of the uh, deep power. So as you can see, this work is mainly uh, a software or algorithm domain uh, driven. And our goal is to have some differentiable and uh, a skill invariant regularizer so that it can be applied into the sparsity methodology directly without having to worry about the optimization uh, of skill. Okay. The second work I would like to introduce is called the Penny. It's a pruned kernel sharing. Um, in fact, uh, um, since we're talking about the efficiency designs, uh, essentially uh, most of them are related to the compression methodologies. And generally speaking about the compression method, there are uh, tons of uh, different ways. The most popular ones, as you know, including uh, the quantizations, like reduce the precision bits of the weight and activations. Um, also, the model design is uh, very important. For example, uh, mobile net is a very typical examples and they represent efficient, compact model designs. So our work uh, usually is talking about the giving models and uh, uh, through regularization or uh, decompositions and how can we improve this. So deep higher works are actually present element-wise pruning and structure prunings. Usually element-wise pruning we also call unstructured prunings. So uh, if we're looking at the sparsity map or the weight matrix map over here, the uh, black dot we may uh, represent non-zero weight elements and the white represent zero weight elements. So unstructured prunings usually can remove many, many of the weight elements. However, the distribution of the non-zero elements, in fact, is quite random and arbitrary. And therefore, when we apply this into the hardware designs, a lot of times this randomness uh, made uh, hardware design implementation difficult so that we couldn't benefit much from it in real execution. Structured pruning becomes uh, more popular in recent years uh, because, in, for example, here, as you can see, for this matrices, uh, the entire columns or the rows will be removed. So you can imagine, essentially, we can squeeze that into a much smaller, uh, dense matrix. And uh, deploy on the hardware, and it becomes uh, quite convenient and easy. So its compression rate is uh, lower than unstructured prunings, and, but uh, it's hardware friendly and execution wise, uh, it can obtain a better result. Decomposition is an, another research line. Essentially, what does it do is uh, decompose the weight matrices and made it to a smaller size with a lower rank, and therefore the entire weight numbers as well as the uh, MAC computation requirement will be reduced. So how to obtain an optimal rank for a low rank approximation, for instance, is tricky because it's uh, going to in introduce the uh, decomposition errors. So if this an error is too large, it might not be recompensated by uh, uh, retraining processes, okay? So uh, in this work, we kind of uh, seek for a methodology, kind of a combine all this advantage like hardware friendly, high compression rate and simple trade-off. And we decided to take uh, the direction of the low rank approximation or decompensations. One of the reasons in fact is in back to 2017, we explore um, uh, low rank approximation uh, in DNN designs, um, not low rank approximation. In fact, we uh, explore the uh, specification on the uh, DNN designs. So one of the observations, in fact, is the convolutional kernels also have a sparse representation. And uh, it can be represented by a few basic kernels. It doesn't have to be, um, it doesn't have to be a full kernel representation. Okay, so even you know the kernel size, the kernel subspace already in a lower dimension, like for three by three, its dimension is like a nine. It's, even it's not that big, we still feel uh, there's a chance. Maybe we can do a further exploration. So in this work, in fact, we developed 
the entire frameworks. Um, the entire framework is since starting with the kernel decompensation. As I uh, uh, mentioned, um, the major technical uh, uh, method over here, in fact, is the low rank approximation. Okay, so again, decompensation itself uh, will induce a certain performance loss, and therefore, we do the retrainings. Uh, I'm going to explain what we call alternative uh, retraining later on. Um, and then the uh, C and D steps and majorly focus on uh, reducing, uh, further reduce the elements by combining with the kind of elements by the pruning and also uh, structure pruning. And the structure pruning on uh, step D over here is not like usually we're talking about regularizer, what kind of the uh, features we observe the uh, during, uh, after the uh, decompensation. I will explain very quickly in the following page. So the first step that goes to the kernel decompensation, okay? Uh, it uh, consists of in several steps over here as well. So that's start with the kind of a future tensor over here. So for this tensor, in the uh, future size is a KL by KL with input channel size in CL and the output channel size in the CL plus one. Okay, so in our first steps, we tend to unroll the kernel along the input channel and output channel dimension. Okay, so after unrolling, uh, it's actually form a weight matrix W, and each row over here represent a 2D kernel. Okay, um, now we actually can conduct the, the decomposition on this and large weight matrix. Uh, in fact, uh, we take a kind of a regular approach like a principal component analysis and PCAs. So we form the original W, uh, we compute the average and uh, get its a covariance and see it over here. Then we conduct a singular value decomposition SVD to obtain an U and a V. And then uh, we select the first K, uh, K column of vectors from U to form what we call the basis matrix. And then, um, you know, project the original kernel uh, with U and U transpose to form the coefficient uh, matrix. Okay, so this is kind of also the regular ways to do this in low rank approximation. So the key thing over here is to select the K um, in order to reduce uh, you know, so, uh, weight parameter numbers and computation requirement, but uh, without hurting the performance and too much, right? So now at this point, we have in two separate matrix called the basis matrix and coefficient matrix. The uh, third step over here, we tend to restore those matrices into the kernel shape. So basis kernels are, uh, uh, kind of will be shared across all the input channels. So as you can imagine, uh, after this uh, convolutional operation with the basic kernels, it will produce in K intermediate feature maps. And this in K intermediate feature maps will be combined with this in a sparse coefficient to produce the final output, okay? Um, so this is kind of a two-step. The first step, like a convolutional operations, and then coefficient, like kind of a matrix or uh, related operations, okay? So in fact, uh, obviously we were not the first one to do the decompensations and there were uh, research in talking about conduct decompensations along the channel uh, direction. Um, uh, like the work over here. Um, so compared to the future decompositions, and what is the difference? For future decompositions, and it's basically divide entire processes into two convolutional processes. The first one, uh, in fact, uh, it contains D filters. And the second one, in order to match the output channels, and it has in CL plus one, filters and its dimension is in one by one by D over here. So in fact, 
the, this is in contains in two-stage matrix multiplication, as you can imagine. And the, the intermediate results over here, like the output from the first stage, need to be uh, accumulated across the output dimensions. And therefore, we need to store all the intermediate feature maps uh, in the middle of the operation. So the memory requirement, in fact, is pretty high. For the kernel decompositions, as you can imagine, first of all, the kernel size itself is not that big. But three by three, the kernel is uh, dimension is nine. So K, capital K over here, it cannot be very big. It's very small numbers. So dimension-wise, it's much smaller than D. Uh, only a few kind of small kernels over here. Secondly, we kind of um, apply this and go through this, we call the coefficient uh, matrices for the tensor over here. And what we do, uh, in fact, we can organize in this uh, in a streaming format. And basically, the intermediate feature maps go through, uh, uh, you know, sparse coefficient. And then uh, the next one coming in and they accumulate together and so on so first. So uh, our design doesn't require intermediate buffer. It's a safe uh, kind of a hardware requirement. Um, so this is the first step. Essentially, this is the uh, most important steps. Um, again, we uh, uh, need to retrain the networks and over here. So what we do is we restore the original 4D tensors uh, as I uh, illustrate uh, over here for training. But what we have is a basic kernel and coefficient, right? So during the trainings, in fact, we alternately train the basic kernel and the coefficient, kind of a decouple the impact and uh, uh, reduce the training complexities and make it converge faster. Um, this is an, a step B, and step C, we apply L1 regularization to the coefficient. In fact, uh, these two kind of uh, combined uh, in practices, and we tend to, during the retraining processes, uh, we tend to kind of uh, uh, remove certain coefficient and make it uh, sparse, okay? Um, and of course, and if we're doing this, and they will potentially uh, prolong the uh, training processes, but based on our observations, the impact, in fact, wasn't very significant. So I'd like to talk about the, the last step model shrinking a little bit. So earlier, I mentioned this is instructor uh, pruning, but uh, we use the term, but it's uh, different from the structure prunings and we uh, uh, published a year ago in NeuroIPS 2016, right? So here, what I really mean over here is um, uh, it's focused on this and coefficient uh, uh, kernel over here. And the basically combined, this is in K uh, uh, coming from the decomposition. And this is the input feature map uh, direction, input channel directions, and this is output channel directions. So if we do unrollings along those directions and coming to the vectors, and this actually coming from the, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's taking us the input of the layer. And uh, if we do unrollings along those two directions, it's actually the output of the layer. So in fact, if we uh, kind of uh, taking this on off, the orange one is coming from layer L, and then the, 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 the blue one basically corresponding to the requirement of the input feature uh, of layer L plus ones, okay? So um, as you can imagine, if any uh, entry uh, of the upper feature map of layer L, the orange one is zero, um, then the operation, corresponding operation to the output feature, uh, sorry, the input feature of the L uh, plus one is not necessary. So versus wise, and if here is in zero and the other side is not necessary. So this step essentially take interaction uh, between two neighboring layers, and then uh, we actually can remove those redundant uh, entries and then make, uh, you know, the uh, coefficient kernels and becomes more uh, sparse. And that's 
uh, also improve the execution efficiency. Okay. Um, so again, uh, I will just uh, briefly go through some uh, experimental results and due to the time constraints. So the first experiment result I want to show uh, is in uh, 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 you know, it's a reduction on the flops, on the computation requirement. We do experiment on the cipher and on the image net. Generally speaking, uh, uh, you know, on VGD and the ResNet, AlexNet, those are popular designs. Generally speaking, then, as the curve indicate over here, um, the uh, uh, parental surface over here shows that uh, we actually have better trade-offs between the accuracy and the operation cost in terms of the gigaflops. Okay, the performance or the accuracy and loss is uh, within the constraints, so uh, we were quite happy about the results. In fact, a little bit further. Um, I mentioned multiple times like uh, for the decompositions the rank selection is essentially important. And uh, um, in fact, then here is show the trade-off of the rank selection on the, the test accuracy versus the um, parameter number and the flops. So the trend obviously is in the lower rank is, and then it requires the results less, uh, fewer parameters and fewer flops requirement like what we have over here. And uh, the uh, negative impact is in, uh, it's kind of encounter um, higher uh, accuracy jobs, right? So we have to make a trade off. So the curve over here is about four retrainings. Um, as you can see, like reduce the kernel size from uh, nine to four or five. Indeed, it doesn't hurt much before the retraining. But if it goes to uh, over here or over here, uh, the job will be uh, pretty dramatic and it's hard to recover. And therefore, in our designs, we usually pick between four and five and six, depends on the situation. Um, the uh, right top, um, in fact, then tend to illustrate the benefit again on the general purpose and platforms. And this is in show uh, memory reduction. So, um, um, you know, uh, this is um, for the CPU implementation and this is for the GPU implementation. Uh, essentially, we kind of see that uh, for both kind of general purpose and platforms and uh, based on the measurement, uh, our method kind of um, can reduce the requirement uh, of the uh, memory consumptions, okay? So um, this actually conclude our second work. So as you can see, the higher is more like regularization uh, designs and purely on the algorithm level. The uh, panel is also on the algorithm levels, but it's more close to uh, the hardware designs and considering uh, you know, its impact on the hardware implementation, okay? And the both works is in, uh, kind of a focus on improving the efficiency of inference of the models, okay? Um, in fact, uh, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, training is uh, very important as well, and we have been serious work on this. But particularly today, I like to introduce uh, Akbar is talking about the tensor partition. Okay, um, so why we focus on tensor partition? In fact, uh, uh, for Patty Unit. Notice that we work on the tensor, and here we again work on the tensors, but more on kind of a training side. Okay, so during the trainings, common sense is in considering the large size of the deep neural networks, and we need to uh, deploy the trainings on multiple servers, multiple nodes, multiple accelerators, right? And um, uh, in fact, uh, there are already a lot of the designs and talking about the heterogeneous accelerators. And those and, uh, already demonstrate certain uh, computing uh, potentials. So the idea over here is in considering the heterogeneous design environment with a kind of in different accelerators. And so how can we do the tensor partitions in order to improve the training uh, efficiency? So, and the second, 
while we focus on the tensors, again, tensor is the basic data unit in deep learning, not only in the inference, but also in training flows. So uh, we're kind of interested in the benefit we can obtain from this. So before I'm moving forward, uh, I'd like to bring some new concept we defined over here. Uh, during the trainings, we all know that it has an, the forward path, essentially input features and uh, kind of operate with uh, the uh, weight matrices and the produced apple features, right? And then um, it's uh, based on the calculations and by the end, it can obtain the Azure. And then there's an arrow, uh, uh, you know, from the, uh, um, from the next layer, from the later layers and work with the weight altogether, uh, kind of a general error of the current layer. And this isn't from the, uh, uh, the last layer and back propagate to the first layer. We call this as the backward propagation. And then uh, during the back propagations and for each layer that so we actually can calculate the gradient. The gradient where the change of the weight will be applied on the weight matrix. This is the general operation requirement occurred in the training processes. So in the following explanations, and we actually denote the tensor with the exactly same shape with one simple, because a lot of our analysis is determined by the shape, okay? So for example, over here, A is denoted as an uh, uh, input feature size, and the input feature size is the same of uh, the uh, the arrow uh, matrix is at the same location, right? So we actually have an A to represent uh, F or E at the layer L, and the B is corresponding to the weight or the gradient of the weight. They also have the same and size and uh, shape, and the C actually corresponding to uh, uh, feature or the arrows um, uh, as uh, input of the layer L plus one, okay? So why we cared about the shape? Um, basically, if we go back to matrix and matrix multiplications, and when we're talking about the partition of those matrix, okay? Initially, uh, we're talking about the matrix A uh, multiplied by matrix B and uh, creating or produce the matrix C. Any node uh, or any entry in matrix C over here uh, requires an entire row and columns, entire row in A and the entire columns at B to complete the calculation, okay? So imagine we do the partition, okay? And uh, in the partition, uh, we perhaps have an, a half row of A and uh, correspondingly, we can load a half uh, column of uh, uh, matrix Bs. The, uh, the product over here, in fact, reflect only the partial accumulation. So if the remaining part goes to another accelerators, and then we need to uh, kind of uh, sum them up uh, together to produce the final results. That's actually indicating their data exchange between the two accelerators, okay? So furthermore, so talking about this and forward, backward propagation together with the gradient calculations, in fact, when we talking about partition the entire training processes across uh, many accelerators, we could have in three types of partition uh, method. So here uh, we say the three types determined by uh, you know, our focus. For example, this one type ones, the focus is the gradient uh, or the weight matrix. And the second will be focused on the forward path. So it's output in fact is the output feature size. And then um, this one in fact is in type three, is a focus on the input feature map, okay? So let me take the hype one as an example to explain over this. If our focus is a weight, and we say now we partition, uh, or we duplicate the entire weight into several uh, 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 accelerators, and then accordingly, each accelerators will only take a partial A and the partial C. 
Okay, and then uh, this actually illustrate the shade over here. Illustrate, okay, for example, alpha uh, times B number of the rows of the A or alpha uh, a portion of uh, uh, matrix A's will be loaded into the accelerator, but it contains the entire copy of the weight matrix. So it can successfully uh, produce, uh, you know, this and shade the uh, output feature map. So it can go through the back propagations, it can conduct the gradient operations. So uh, this two path, forward and backward, in fact, it doesn't involve a lot of interlayer uh, data exchanges. But when we do the calculation of the gradients, right, the update, update of the gradients need to apply and send distribute across all the accelerators involved. So it involves some quite significant uh, interlayer, uh, not in the inter accelerator uh, communication. Okay, so this is only talking about the uh, one example for the other partition method. In fact, we can follow the same concept. So we here we define the partition cost. Partition cost essentially uh, is composed by the computation cost and the communication cost. Computation cost is the number of the flops to do this multiplications. Uh, because an add addition itself and takes a lot of a less of uh, uh, resources, and so we simply kind of ignore this. Okay, um, and the CI over here is used to present computation power of A accelerators, and then um, you know uh, E uh, CPs and kind of a represent the cost, the uh, computation cost for this uh, accelerator. The right hand side, in fact, is the communication cost. It's defined by the size of the tensor, and then BI is the uh, bandwidth of the accelerators. In fact, the, the communication cost, as we all know, contains of the uh, intralayer cost and the interlayer cost. And the inter intralayer cost is the one uh, for the partial uh, sum accumulation. So we discussed it before. So, um, you know, uh, the paper actually cover a lot of uh, detailed explanations, and, but, you know, just for illustration purposes here, I only show the partition cost for uh, interlayer cost, okay? So what I indicate over here is um, this is layer L and this is in layer L plus one, okay? So if they apply the same type of uh, partition methods, or different partition methods, we actually can analyze this, its interlayer cost. So for example, here, they both apply type two, okay? So uh, for um, the layer L, okay, the apple feature map in fact are distributed or can be obtained from uh, uh, multiple accelerators. And one is then propagated to uh, layer L uh, plus one, what happens is in, uh, along the forward directions, this is only a portion of the entire, uh, uh, you know, input feature map of L uh, plus one. It's a portion of the output feature map produced by uh, uh, layer L. So it doesn't involve the actual communication cost. For back propagation, however, um, the E L plus one from accelerator A, for example, can contribute only partial of this, right? So in fact, uh, this in black indicating the hole or the shape, the, the, the missing part that has to be grabbed from other accelerators and over here, okay? So this uh, kind of be taken as the interlayer cost. We analyze this and um, different types of combinations and because then we have a three uh, partition uh, possibilities and then uh, for any two adjacent layers uh, arbitrary combinations and their uh, nine possibilities and so we actually analyze them all of them and uh, further on in, we include uh, intralayer communication costs and also computation cost so the purpose of all this analysis is to determine per layer uh, what is the most 
uh, uh, what is the partition shall be taken. So to determine each layer, uh, how can we configure this into type one or two or threes? We apply dynamic programming approach to determine, uh, to calculate the total partition cost. Okay, so uh, the concept over here is starting from the frame end, and then we calculate the uh, the cost along the uh, frame directions, and then at the end we back propagate. We start from any of them and pick the uh, kind of a smallest one and tracing backs and to find the most efficient one. Okay. Um, another trick, in fact, we applied over here is um, imagine there are uh, 200 accelerators on the designs. And we have to not only partition, also have to map the design or the different layers into those um, accelerators. So um, with this uh, mappings, in fact, uh, uh, we use this in hierarchical structure usually. And therefore, the partition can also follow this in hierarchical structure. So uh, we actually uh, uh, kind of uh, think that every hierarchy layers, like uh, this layers, A0 and A1s, will adopt the similar ways. And then we kind of um, back propagate and trace and see how is the uh, overall designs and how we like to uh, have the best uh, combination. So uh, we'll be very quickly in here, we show the performance on heterogeneous and architectures. Uh, well, heterogeneous in here indicating we, we use in TPU v2 and TPU v3 combinations. And then we actually combine our methodologies like data parallelism uh, and also previous work on OWTs uh, and our own uh, previous work on the high bars. So, uh, due to the time constraints, and very quickly, as you can see, um, uh, from hyper to uh, uh, ACPAR, basically, uh, we have this uh, performance at where partition, okay, and also we uh, have in type three partition methodology, so it's gains. And the VGE series and over here have um, bigger gains, uh, mainly because in um, uh, uh, ResNet convolutional dominance. Uh, well, VGD again is free and nuclear dominance. Um, we also did a summary evaluation for the homogeneous accelerators, like we have a 200 T, uh, TPU V2 or TPU V3s. So essentially, the gain is less than the heterogeneous, and that's why we say this mapping is particularly important for the heterogeneous and designs. I also illustrated the partition methodologies and cross layers over here, just for your reference. Um, so this is actually conclude uh, our design methodologies. So uh, since there's not much time, so I will jump into a quick introduction of our lab. We call our lab is a Center for Computation uh, computational uh, evolutionary intelligence. And uh, we work from circuit level to architecture and then to the algorithm levels, compression is aimed for the efficiency. Uh, neural architecture search is also a big line of uh, our research and trying to uh, fundamentally uh, find a certain uh, architecture designs for the neural network. And the distributed is focused on mainly on the trainings. So this is an, uh, our uh, recent research uh, focus. To uh, conclude today's talk, in fact, again, I think talking about efficiency and the scalabilities, okay, uh, we need to solve on both ways in inference and the training. Um, and uh, on inference uh, part, uh, we need to get certain convenient ways uh, to obtain uh, sparse or compressed neural networks. Uh, also, we need to consider about the hardware requirement. And this is an, where we sit uh, deep lawyer and the penny. Um, for the training side, in fact, I guess, and there are more rooms to play because and this is a more challenging task. Tensor partition uh, is very specific to identify the combinations of the partition methodology, tensor partition methodology across layer. So this is more like a finer granularity explorations. I didn't talking about autochrome 
uh, uh, this talk. Um, in fact, this is a neural architecture search approach. It's more like during the search uh, strategies, and how can we adapt the, the depth of the network corresponding to the data set requirement and also a hardware requirement. So it's automatically flow, but it's also need uh, a lot of tricks when we control you know, uh, the growing processes. Uh, so I apologize and takes longer time than needed, uh, but this is actually conclude my talk. Uh, I really appreciate you come uh, to my talk and your questions are welcome. Great, great. Uh, so now let's open up for questions. Um, I see two questions here. Um, mm -hmm. For those of you who haven't got the chance to type your question, you can either raise your hand or uh, type your question in the Q&A chat. So now I'm gonna unmute uh, some of the Haorang and Cao Jian. I saw the question here. Sure. Uh, I think you can speak now. Uh, yes, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Yes. Okay, okay thanks for the great talk. And uh, I have a, one quite big question for the first introduced work, the deep uh, whole year. Whole year. Uh -huh. uh, year. It looks uh, simple and effective. So, I, uh, so my question is that, when you apply the adaptive threshold for trimming the smaller magnitude uh, width, mm -hmm. uh, I'm curious how you achieve such dynamic changes and will this threshold related to the defined pruning ratios? Okay, so uh, actually this is a very good question. And we call this as auto training. And so indicating this in a training process is at least that the threshold will be adapted by uh, uh, itself. So, um, so uh, how do I uh, apply the threshold? In fact, uh, we do not define the threshold. Uh, we do not uh, yeah, we do not define, we do not give a number of the threshold. In fact, the threshold is determined by this. So WJ is, and when we do this in uh, derivatives and gradient calculations, right, uh, this is with respect to the WJ. And uh, uh, if you use in this term, divide by this term, this kind of be taken as the threshold for the WJ. Okay, so through the training and um, I, WI all changing and uh, gradually because the more and more zeros and will be uh, getting into this and therefore this and threshold uh, will be automatically increase and gradually. Okay, so at the beginnings and the training will focus or work for very small uh, value weight and then it's kind of uh, gradually relax the constraints and uh, applies to some larger weight. Um, how can we control the sparsities? In fact, there is no uh, hyperparameter to apply it over here and say, okay, a certain of the sparsities and we stop. Uh, in fact, this is a drawback of this approach. Uh, obviously, we do not favor to train like a thousand uh, epochs because it, it may kind of hurt very large weights as well. And therefore, uh, I mean, in practice, and we simply monitor the situation and say what is the pruning rate and the uh, corresponding accuracy. Okay, get you. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And uh, Chao Jin, I think you can uh, speak your questions yeah. now. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Professor Nin. And uh, mm -hmm. I have a question about the auto course. Uh, yeah, and its motivation is other NAS. Uh, search both operators, widths and uh, depths. Uh, what's the motivation of only exploring the depths in network architecture, uh, especially in auto? Okay, yeah, I also, I think this is a very good question. And in fact, um, for the entire, uh, you know, exploration uh, 
on NAS, um, people kind of uh, developed a lot of different strategies. As you can see, the operations, the network uh, architectures and so on so forth so will all play an uh, important role. So the motivation of an auto grow, in fact, is seeing, for example, right now for the ResNet, the structure itself so looks uh, pretty neat and effective. But the question, in fact, is then how can we build up the the uh, optimal combination of uh, different uh, stages, okay? So for uh, especially the users and already have a, a, a kind of a, a dedicating word expected uh, uh, architectures and uh, our goal over here is to help them to find the best configuration. So the method itself and doesn't, since it's an exploration uh, uh, space is not that big, so even this taking as in partial of the NAS, its runtime is a lot of uh, shorter. And just for such kind of uh, configurations, and it can bring you a uh, kind of uh, uh, optimal uh, configuration. So in the work, in fact, uh, we focus on just the one by one and the three by three. Um, uh, and trying to make the criteria like when we stop on the stage and when we kind of uh, uh, continue on the stage and when we stop and her uh, kind of a searchings you know one uh, we kind of can um, grow because uh, as you can see majority of the currently effective neural networks and if you're looking at it, it's a building blocks it's a kind of a simple and small yeah okay. mm -hmm. Perfect. Thank, okay. you. thank you and uh, look now is your turn uh, okay uh, thank uh, uh, thank you for the amazing talk. So uh, my question is about, uh, more about general. So I saw like these uh, these current like compression techniques is very um, like is, is definitely extraordinary. And in one of uh, a scenario, I think these can be um, widely used and uh, like can be put in good use is distributed learning and federal learning. And I saw in the uh, in the introduction in our uh, event page, and you say like uh, you you were thinking about uh, the uh, applications in federal learning and distributed learning. So I I just want to um, like know what's the your general ideas about the implementation of these techniques in the uh, distributed learning and all federal learning uh, scenarios. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that's also a very good question. And in fact, uh, uh, in annual two thousand seventeen, so we start. Uh, the exploration on the distributed computing. So in that works, and we're talking about uh, uh, reduce the precision of the gradients yeah. during the distributed learning, okay? So this is uh, where we start uh, along those lines. Um, afterwards, in fact, there are a lot of explorations. And for instance, and the latest in KDD works in our labs and kind of uh, discussing uh, for federal learning, for instance, and um, uh, a lot of times, and user only need a subset of the model, and uh, can we kind of build up some representative and local model for each uh, uh, user, and then only uh, exchange a small number of the gradients and with the uh, you know the cloud. So. Uh, this is another approach right now we are working on. And of course, in doing this and kind of a combinations, we also explore the possibilities to uh, reduce the, for instance, the gradient uh, of precision and the so on so forth. So personally, um, I think federal learning is even more difficult. The major thing is, in, uh, the major reason in fact is in each uh, users can own only a piece of the information. So how to control the uh, convergence or how to ensure the convergence is an, uh, a little bit challenging. So I guess um, even we have this in explorations and I do think this is the right direction to go. Um, more importantly, the uh, architecture defined between uh, originally top model versus the uh, sub models and this uh, need to be carefully uh, handled. Um, otherwise, I guess, and uh, practically, it could encounter uh, some problem. Um, but yeah, we also have an, uh, a line of the research on this direction. Okay. Then, thanks. Thank you so much. Uh, thank Here's you. Uh, I'm going to take the final opportunity. So uh, you have uh, 
uh, make pioneering effort in, in different aspects of efficient learning at scale from the very beginning of the structure pruning uh, network to the recent uh, planning work that try to combine, reduce the complexity from different aspects. So looking forward, uh, where do you think we should look for the opportunity for the next uh, uh, order of improvement? Um. Or maybe sure. more specifically, more uh, more from the application level or the system level or the model itself. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, I guess and there are uh, uh, extensive and discussions and uh, some of them, in fact, our uh, uh, group didn't take. For example, I noticed and Professor Lin, your group and has an essential works on RPML real time machine learnings. Um, I do feel this is a very important uh, research direction. It kind of uh, combine the uh, machine learning designs with the hardware constraints and directly and the build flows and from initial model development to the trainings and then to the hardware deployment optimizations and then kind of a, a inference and so on so forth. I do feel uh, this is not having uh, significant meanings to uh, researcher and uh, industry. Um, so beyond this, and I, I, I take it as a part of uh, NAS research. So NAS is certainly in a direction that we believe it will be very useful. So my background is more like a circuit and uh, computing systems. I guess and this becomes more and more automatic. Uh, my envision like for the futures and DNA designs perhaps is more like uh, automatic as well. Um, so application domains, I guess, and uh, substantial works um, occurs on uh, acoustic uh, related application, language processing, uh, timing series and uh, processing. So um, I guess compared to the image or the vision processing, and uh, you know, uh, uh, the processing on uh, the sound and also uh, videos and relatively still weak. Um, one of the reasons, for example, we work on the video, uh, the computation cost is very high and then the performance is very low. But it's essentially is necessary for, uh, for example, we mentioned about autonomous cars, those in real applications. Um, another thing, uh, I mean, uh, I mean many things, but another thing I think is very important will be the multimodality uh, combined uh, DNN works. Uh, transfer learning and sound first uh, uh, will be important. But personally, I kind of are curious, like, uh, for example, again, uh, um, um, autonomous cars and situations, the input could be the image and could be the sound, it could be uh, radar, it could be LiDAR. And then how can we combine the input from different sources and make the decision making? So um, I don't know, I, I think this will be also interesting and important. Thanks a lot for sharing those uh, visionary thoughts. I, I really like your talk style. I think uh, we learned the basic behind the idea, but also get the uh, high level, uh, uh, key uh, level, uh, high level key ideas of the, the, the techniques and also the, uh, the effectiveness. Yeah, thanks a lot for sharing those uh, very interesting aspects, also impressive work of efficient deep learning at scale. Uh, so maybe if there are no other questions, we can stop here and hopefully we soon have you visit us in person. <laughs> sure, sure. To the audience, thank you all very much for attending this seminar. Yeah. Thank you all and thank you, uh, you know, Ingyan for the great opportunity as well. I also welcome you and your students visit Duke sometime later. Look forward to that. Yeah, thank you. Thanks.